Well, now Britain's cathedrals and their music, a programme in the extended weekly series in which we're exploring some of the music of the English Cathedral Service. Today we visit Lichfield, where again the scene is set by John Betjeman. We shall be hearing the Cathedral Choir, directed by the organist and master of the choristers, Richard Greening, who is assisted by Robert Green. If this country has a heart in a particular place, it is here at Lichfield Cathedral, bang in the middle of England. Such an unexpected oasis of quiet in the roar of the industrial Midlands. And the quiet is intensified now the lorries have been deflected from the main streets. And there's a gate across the close to keep through traffic out. You can feel the atmosphere of a church capital by walking about in the planted surroundings of this pink sandstone cathedral with its three tall spires rising from a merry confusion of pinnacles and sculpture. There are the medieval parts of the close, places like the little half-timbered square where the vicar's choral used to live, and many of them still do. They were the men's voices you heard singing I Give You a New Commandment by John Shepherd at the opening of this programme. And then in the close, there's also the fine Renaissance bishop's palace in grey and brown stone, the red brick Georgian deanery next door, and many another Georgian house in pale midland brick, each in its park and with a little walled garden. There's the great stretch of water east of the cathedral, 
with a church on its edge and Georgian brick mansions beyond. Every large house has its view of either water or cathedral spires or both. Dr Johnson, that stout high churchman, was born in Litchfield and his city was subsequently inhabited by 18th century blue stockings who've left their mark in houses with Venetian windows, grand front doors and wrought iron entrance gates. Moated, protected and much loved, Litchfield is, what the signs say on the entrances to the city, the mother of the Midlands. It's dedicated to Our Lady and St Chad. St Chad was the first bishop of Litchfield in the seventh century and drew together into one communion the Angles and the Celtic Britons. The eighth century gospels of St Chad, written on vellum and decorated like the Book of Kells, are one of the cathedral's treasures. They are a survival from the time when Litchfield really was the church capital of England. And for 15 glorious years, the archbishopric, and more important even than Canterbury, that was a thousand years ago. The Normans rebuilt the cathedral, but it soon became too small for pilgrims to the shrine of St. Chad, who was one of the most popular saints of the Middle Ages. The singularly perfect cathedral you see today was rebuilt in the short time for those days of a century and a quarter, from about 1200 to about 1330, and it's the flowering of the middle-pointed period of Gothic, early English to decorated. It was made as a shrine for St Chad. The pilgrims were ferried over the water on the south, and there they walked up steps outside the south transept door, and then they turned to the right when they got in, past the choir of the canons, on their way to the shrine in the Lady Chapel. Great love can easily turn to great hate. Cromwell's soldiers bombarded the cathedral and smashed down the central spire. They desecrated the interior more than that of any other English cathedral. But after them, and in the 18th century, when the church was generally and wrongly supposed to be dead, Litchfield was restored and rebuilt, spires and all. Come in and see the perfection of its proportions. The multiplicity of carved stone and coloured glass give you a feeling of being in a casket of jewels, an enormous one. And there's the long vaulted roof, the same height and design down the whole length, deep-set triangular clerestory windows. Below this, a triforium richly carved with leaves and dog-tooth moulding, and below this, the tall, stately nave and choir arches, with their many mouldings and leafy capitals. The first things that strike you are the proportion and the stone carving. Next comes the painted glass. Here, in the apsidal-ended Lady Chapel, where St Chad's shrine used to stand, are enormous windows filled with the best 16th century glass in England in deep blues and greens and burning gold. It came from Belgium, from a convent suppressed by Napoleon. In the south transept is glowing Georgian stained glass. And here and in other windows is the best work of the late Victorian stained glass artist C.E. Kemp. And then there are other things to see, like the ten-sided chapter house and library above it, and Chantry's sculpture of the sleeping children, and Epstein's bust of Bishop Woods. Also a beautiful chamber organ in this lady chapel. The case is the same case that housed the instrument on which John Alcock played in the 1750s. We're in the heart of England, in its small, most exquisite cathedral. Around us on two sides there's water, and on the other two sides a dry moat. And there are those houses in their little parks, the Bishop's Palace, where David Garrick gave his first public performance, and that's now a school. The boys from it will be singing here this afternoon. Boys have lent their voices to men's in Litchfield Cathedral Choir, 
since the reign of Henry III. Listen to the full choir now, here in the Lady Chapel, for the first half of their programme. They sing now pieces from that glorious period of English church music, the early 17th century, when David heard that Absalom was slain by Michael East, who was the organist here at that time, and Factumis Silentium by Richard Deering.
Now we shall hear the Agnus Dei from Bird's four-part mass, sung in the English translation, as is the custom in communion services at Litchfield Cathedral. Now that beautiful anthem by Purcell, which we also heard last week from Chichester, Hear my prayer, O Lord, and let my crying come unto thee.
choir now go back to their choir stalls through the light metal screen designed by Sir Gilbert Scott. The acoustics in the choir are strangely dry, no one quite knows why, so we'll sit a little way down the nave, from which point we can see both cases of the large organ. This fine instrument was built by Hill in 1908 and has not been touched since. This is why it still retains its original pitch, which you may notice is a bit higher than what is standard nowadays. Robert Green plays on it a prelude by William Harris, who was once the assistant organist here. Then Richard Greening conducts a short anthem, Almighty and Most Merciful Father, by his predecessor Ambrose Porter, who retired in 1959, and that's followed by Murrell's Carillon for Organ.
organ now combine and end this program with Benjamin Britten's Tedium and Jubilate in C major.
That recorded programme in our weekly series, Britain's Cathedrals and Their Music, came from Litchfield. And we're very sorry there wasn't time to include the Alcock Voluntary. <laughs>